Let me tell you about the best way to make two-sided PCBs at home. What? Wild claim. Yes. Not my home. Also true. But wild evidence. I mean, this is fast. It's cheap. It's drilled. There's no chemicals. There's no etching. It's perfectly aligned on both sides. There's no babysitting processes. I mean, okay, maybe not the best, but this is really good. Let me show you. This is not actually the traditional PCB engraving technique where you use these like super fine, out of focus PCB engraving bits. Those work. They're a little bit slow. Um, they're a little bit finicky. Sometimes they break and you got to start your board over, but I've made very nice boards this way. And um, with the right machine, you can actually make great boards this way. But what I'm actually using here is these El Cheapo two for $10 scriber bits. And what you could do is you just pull out the bit on this, throw this part away. Um, and now you have a tungsten carbide, super sharp bit. that's very dimensionally stable because it's concentric and you don't spin it. You just scratch it 0 0.04 millimeters into your board and uh, you can make a PCB this way. Now there's two ways to do it. If you want, a, want super fine traces, meaning only one scratch, and this is like under four mils, what you do is you auto level your board, cover it with layout fluid, or in fact, you can cover it with Sharpie. I've done many boards this way. That works really well. Three or four passes of this. Um, and then you scratch the PCB design pattern into this side, flip it over, scratch it into that side, etch it in your favorite essence solution, and you get a, pretty much a perfect board every time. A little bit hard to solder because you're dealing with the space of this scratch, which is very, very fine. Second technique, which I way prefer, but maybe like four mil traces is the lowest I've went with this. But basically what you do is you scratch into the PCB and you do multiple passes. Concentric, but slightly offset. You scratch once, the offset scratch will actually peel the copper up and off the board. You do a third pass, and now you're down to the bare board underneath and there's no short in between. And I don't want to say this works every time, and I don't want to say this is a perfect technique, but so far this has worked every time and it's a perfect technique. What about equipment? Well, you're going to need a CNC milling machine. For etching? Not necessarily. You can etch a lot of ways, and all of those work pretty good. I mean, this is amazing, but you can etch different ways. What you really need it for is drilling. You're going to have to drill, and this is often underlooked, but you're going to have to drill thousands of tiny little holes with these tiny little bits. And if you do it with your tiny little hands, you will break these every time. If you use a drill press, you will go crazy, and you don't want that. What you really want is a CNC milling machine. Are they expensive? They can be. I mean, this one, two, $3,000 range, rock solid, does anything, but they go all the way down to like $150. I'm not sure those would work. If you have one and it works or doesn't work, please let me know. What about more expensive? Well, yes, you can get these things so expensive, they don't even work. But ultimately, you know you want a CNC milling machine because it does anything. Anything plus drill and etch PCBs at home. Win-win. <music> making two-sided PCBs at home, the easiest part to screw up is alignment. And to avoid that, you're going to want to make a PCB jig. Now, these are very simple. You just mill a flat surface into MDF, something that thing is very good at, and then you insert four pegs at a known location. Actually, at a known offset from your machine's origin, that way you'll never have to probe X, Y again. You're only looking for the surface. Um, and then for these pegs, and you don't want to use screws, you want to use pegs because screws are a little bit wonky when it comes to really, really fine precision work. Uh, for these pegs, a thing called rivet nuts works really well. They have a flange on the bottom, a screw down the middle, and a known outer diameter at the top. So what you can do is drill a large hole in the bottom of your jig, a small one in the top. You push these in to the point that when they're flush, they stick exactly 1.5 millimeters above the surface. Why 1.5? Well, in advance, you're going to cleverly measure the height of your board and find it 1.6. So that extra millimeter, when you screw in the board, allows not only dimensional stability, but a very strong clonking force. So any side to side or up and down motions will be really, really stable. Um, once you have your jig made, and you can make a lot of these for any different sizes of boards you have, they take minutes actually, and then you just create your blank to fit them. Um, you just screw this in the machine and you're ready to mill, scratch, drill your first PCB. First thing you're gonna wanna do is open PCB new directly. Import two copies of your board, place them I mean, ideally centered, but it doesn't have to be actually. It can be wherever you like. As long as it's not in the four corners of your template here, those map to exactly the PC blanks you've made. And if you put part of your circuit over that, a screw holding it down is gonna intersect with the scriber bit and you're gonna have what's called a crash. That's bad. Second thing you're gonna need to do, you're gonna need to go up here to this auxiliary axis element. If you want the origin to be in the bottom left of your PCB template in the center of that hole. Click there, there'll be a little red circle. That's your auxiliary axis. 
after that is just the plain old file plot, which um, is normally how you export Gerber's file plot. And you want to make sure use auxiliary access as origin is checked right here. And then just simply plot. That will generate your Gerber files for your front and back hopper or whatever's checked in this side menu here. And now generate drill files, all the defaults are fine here. Okay, normally Gerbers are enough, but we're creating contours here, so we're gonna have to import our drill files, which I did, just did with Control E, and our Gerber files, which I'm doing with Control G. I'll import the front and back copper here. Okay, first thing we're gonna need to do is offset it based on the origin of your machine. I know mine is 20, 30 millimeters, and I'm gonna copy that because I'm gonna have to do it three times. Offset the back copper, go to the front copper, offset it, and go to the project, Exelon files, and offset. All right, second thing we're going to need to do, two-sided tool. And for this, it's very simple. We just select the board and we calculate bounds value. So the most important thing here is you want to mirror your back board, not your front board, and you want to mirror your drill file. The board has been flipped, so now we can go and generate our actual pass. For our paths, it's going to come down to settings here. Tool diameter, 0 0.05 millimeters. This is all the metric. I use three passes here. You can get away with two. If you're doing scratch milling, you only need one. Um, be sure to click combine here, otherwise you're going to have to load different files as you're milling them. This will combine all those into one pass. Generate isolation geometry. This is the second area where it's very important. Once you have these settings the way you want them, you can go edit preferences and record them there. And all the preferences are in here. Um, just make sure you fool around a bit before you actually carve that into stone here with preferences. Okay, cut depth 0 0.04, negative 0 0.04, that really works for me. Travel distance. Travel Z distance is one. That's just how far up it goes when it moves to the next thing. There's no point in going too high there. Uh, you can really crank the feed rate on this, especially with the machine I have, I guess, but maybe all machines. Be sure spindle speed is zero. And because spindle is not turning, you don't need to dwell. Um, there's no tool change because we're always using scriber bit. So we just generate our CNC object. And now we just do exactly the same for the front board. Generate isolation geometry. That all is good. Defaults are fine that I've set. Generate CNC object. Save CNC code front. Now the last thing is a little different. It's the drill files. So there's four types of drills in here. We want to go two millimeters down. We don't need multiple depths. The travel is how much it comes up when it moves. I find if I go a little bit higher, I'm less likely to break the drill bit. Uh, feed rate Z300, you can definitely go better than that. Make sure you have dwell, otherwise you'll hit the board when it's not fully up to speed spinning. I just crank it to the maximum spindle speed. The other important thing here is tool change. This setting does not always take in the G code that's generated here, uh, but yes, you do want to have it pause between drill changes. All right, generate CNC object. We can do all the drills at once here. And then of course we save that CNC code. We have all the G code generated. Now we're just gonna mill the board. Okay, now we're ready for milling. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put the scriber bit in. Um, and when we put this in, we, you wanna choke it up as far as you can, really. There's no, no advantage to having, uh, well, there's no advantage to having it stick out a long way. It just makes it less stable. Uh, with this jig, that um, there's a few things about it. First, I have an area that I can actually create blanks here. I just put in the large blank and then I cut it in two places and then um, I actually mill all the holes. And now here, here's the small blank that comes from that. And the other thing to notice about these areas is I've actually milled a pocket on the inside of it. I have two that I can, I can make two boards at a time here. Oops. All right. So you can see here, there's a little pocket. So most of the board's not even touching the ground. And when I do um, scratch milling with uh, layout fluid or Sharpie marker, when you flip it, you don't want that Sharpie marker necessarily to be against the MDF wood here because it might smear or run or last screw here. And the most important thing on this last screw, we want to connect this probe here. Um, and this probe is used for auto leveling and Z probing. Next step, um, we want to probe. So for this program, we're going to, first of all, we're going to load in our front file, which I've already done. And now first thing we're going to do is go to the probe tool, auto level menu and scan the margins. And the other advantage of doing the scan here is when you probe, your Z is going to be in the correct place. Okay, now when we probe, make sure that however you're hooking up your circuit, some people do it on the machine like this. I do it on this tool post, make sure this is connected and make sure that's set up. If you're not sure how to set up, I have a blog post about that. Now, what you're going to want to do is set Z to zero and then make sure you're probing with no X, Y position here. Let's just probe. Okay, we've reached the surface. So now we're going to set Z to zero. All right, go to the auto level. It's asking you how many probes do you want to go across and how many probes do you want to go down? That's like up and down in this area. Let's just auto level it now. There's two things here called scan. You want the big scan menu, not the small scan one. All right, and it's auto probing. Okay. 
Okay, so that's complete. We're now just ready to start running the file. So let's do that. I'll start to run and it's gonna to start to scratch. Okay, that's side one milled. Now we're just gonna flip the board and um, do the exact same thing to the to the back side. Okay, we'll put in our first bit. Make sure it's snug because we're only measuring our Z height once. Okay, we'll lower our bit. And now there's a crucial thing here. Make sure you move into an area that still connects. Otherwise you'll probe and you will not get connectivity and it will smash your bit into the bottom. All right, let's go to probe. We'll Z zero this and probe. So make sure you said Z zero. We don't need to auto level. So all we need to do is run our drill files. Tool change, that's been done. We can resume. Be sure not to touch the vacuum to your drill bit because these drill bits are very sensitive and they will snap. These will be double drilled again for large capacitors. And the final one. These are connector holes. Resume. Okay, where's the spooge? Let's get this off and have a look. Sometimes the drill holes don't go all the way through. You can just put it back on and um, re-drill it. Oh, this is down pretty solid here. All right, there we go. Looks pretty good. And the back seems to have drilled through all the way. That's good. Okay, that sums up the way I'm making PCBs at home. So far anyway, it changes a lot. Changes every day, in fact. And yeah, I don't actually think this is the best, well, Maybe this is the best way to make PCBs at home, and shucks, <laughs> lucky me. But if not, while you are watching any ideas you've had or things you've tried in the past that might work with this, I would love to hear about them. And if you try this yourself, love to know the results you have with it. And until then, 